Well, where should we begin, you guys? Should we start with messy and end with messy or <laughs> lead with messy and messier? I want to start with Wendy Williams. Give the video a like, a thumbs up, share, share subscribe, comment, do all the, the, the relevant things. Because, gang, over the weekend, Lifetime Television aired a two-part documentary, two-night documentary about Wendy Williams. Where is Wendy Williams was the name of it. And um, it was very graphic. It was pretty explicit. And it showed this once towering media personality um, in a state of mental and physical decline, okay? Um, and the first night I watched it, I thought I was being taken, meaning I didn't believe necessarily what I was seeing. I was seeing a person so seemingly disconnected from real life. I thought it was an act. I thought she was putting us on. I thought at the end of night two, we were being set up for the launch of the new Wendy Williams podcast coming to Spotify or whatever the fuck. I just knew we were being primed for some sort of marketing ploy. And when the second night ended, and no such launch announcement came. I said, wow, uh, this, a lot of this might have been real. A lot of this might have been real. And to be clear, I think I, I've said it before. <laughs> and I know y'all like, Kim, yes, you've said this numerous times. You do not like Wendy Williams. Yes, but the reasons that I don't like Wendy Williams is because, I, I, I first, I, I have a certain respect for her, but I do not like, nor do I appreciate, nor do I admire in any way. Uh, the ways in which she reached the heights of her fame, right? Wendy Williams created a reputation as being a gossip, as being the go-to person for Black entertainment gossip. But in, in doing so, um, she ceased to be a reporter and more of a commentator, more of a moral judgment passer, on how certain celebrities were conducting themselves, or she was quick to amplify gossip, things that had not yet been corrected nor verified, nor any of that. And in addition to what I took really particular umbrage to with her insistence on trying to out closeted gay entertainers or people rumored or suspected to be gay who may not have even been gay, <laughs> but she didn't let that stop her. Um, Watching her documentary reminded me of the absolute harassment that she gave Whitney Houston about Whitney's substance abuse, right? In particular, like very specifically, it was, it was Whitney on crack, is Whitney on coke, Whitney, Whitney, Whitney. And it's like, retrospectively looking back, like, bitch, <laughs> you not only admitted that you had a coke problem, and here you are being very um, condemning and m somewhat smug and mocking about Whitney's obvious substance abuse problem. You put down the Coke and picked up the bottle. Okay. And I wanted to just remind folks, because I know people, <laughs> it's wild to me. Like I, I think that everybody knows about Wendy Williams' past prior to her getting the Wendy Williams show, which aired on daytime television for 10 years. But I, I'm realizing that you actually have to be at least 40 or older to even know about Radio Whitney. And she, Whitney, Radio Wendy, <laughs> and she was a menace. She was an absolute menace. Will, I want you to cue up the, the Wendy Williams, because I want to get to some of the clips of the documentary, but for those who don't know the kind of shit that Wendy Williams would, would play, cue up that Whitney Houston joint, Will, and I want you to cue it to about five minutes, five seconds. And uh, let, let me know when you get it up there, because this is a very infamous exchange uh, between Whitney Houston and Wendy Williams, and this came after months of Wendy dragging Whitney on her very popular, I believe at the time syndicated radio show. Just, just, just as a set aside, 
Charlemagne the God was Wendy Williams' sidekick. So that should give you an indication of her lineage of terrible, right? And I'm going to come back to you Wendy Williams fans out there because all of this rewriting of who she was and what she did, they all this shit, they were like, oh, Wendy was such an inspiration and Wendy just, t- just told it like it was. What did she tell besides mess? What the fuck inspiration did anybody find from Wendy Williams content? All she did was talk shit and pop mess. I need to know the ways in which any audience was positively uplifted by Wendy Williams. And I said, these sad ass niggas out here. (laughs) I was like, you niggas don't even have taste. You niggas don't even know what real inspiration is. If this, is this your queen? (laughs) Is this your queen of inspiration? I would even find more, I would even be more respectful to motherfuckers who fake said Oprah. Cause goddamn, at least Oprah do say some shit <laughs> that might lift you up. What the fuck has Wendy Williams ever said that has inspired anything positive? You got to join queued up, Brother Will. Yep. All right. Is that my about brother. five minutes in? I, I think I got it in. I think. Yeah. About five, five oh five, and you just just let it run, just let it run to the end. So go ahead and play that when you're ready. All right. Your schedule on a day-to-day basis. Oh, who you gonna talk about? How you gonna talk about them? Yes. Yeah, that's how I do. So we play, we love the song, the Dear John Letter here on the show. Yes, ma'am. And um, speaking of letters. You no longer have to write to Bobby. Bobby's out of jail. Bobby's back home now. Yes, baby. You ain't. I don't you. You get on this. Hold on. So you got the four one one. You should know. I want to make sure that I have all my stories straight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, baby. He's home. Well and intact. Do you regret Diane Sawyer interview? No. Why should I? Well, it didn't exactly show you in the best light. You don't think so? Well, you know, Wendy, you don't show yourself in the best light. People still listen to you. Yeah, but I'm on the radio every day. Yeah, we, see, we, don't, we just don't get to see your face, but they should know what you look like. I understand that, uh, Whitney. Perhaps one day I will have a TV show, but in terms of what I do, yeah. when I'm not shown in the best light, I guess mm-hmm. one of the best things that I love about my career is, is that there's always tomorrow to come back. See, and I love about my career uh-huh. because my music speaks for itself. Yeah, well, it does. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I am the second wife most interviewed behind Monica Lewinsky in the history of interviews. I'm surprised you're second to her. I mean, as far as... You know, I mean, you're not, like, too cool if I come behind her, but, you know, it's all right with me because, um, you know, I got a lot of mileage from that. And I think that people, basically, the people that I talk to that have made comments to me uh-huh. were very proud of me because it was a moment... See, I'm not one for sitting down and talking to people. I, You know, you can talk all you want about me, but my mother always said, don't try to be find a lie with truth, you know, because then you make it worse because people like to lie for whatever reason they like to lie on you about. Right. However, um, I thought that it was a major step for me to sit with Diane Sawyer, the biggest interviewer in the world, and talk with her and give her what um, basically um, I thought I could get, you know? And I think people enjoy that, seeing me and seeing um, me growing and being a spiritual person and that I have a family that loves me and cares about me and protects me. And um, that was the um, idea, well, Wendy. Yeah, no, it, it was very entertaining. <laughs> It was entertaining. Uh, yes. Ah, you're funny. Uh, yeah, I mean, please, me and everybody, we, we were all watching together. I recently... It was a very funny moment. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, from from start to end, it was quite entertaining, Whitney. Well, I'm glad you entertained, because you watched it, didn't you? So, so Whitney, as, as far as you stand with drug use, is there drug use going on at this present time? Who are you talking to? To you, Whitney. You. No, you're not talking to me. I'm a mother. Only my mother has privy to that information. You talk to your child about that. Don't ask me no questions like I'm a child. You talk to your baby about her, what, what she gonna be uh, confronting or what she gotta deal with. And, uh, and Don't it, ask me like I'm a child, because I'm a child, Wendy. My child is a little boy, and I will talk to him yeah, about drugs. Don't talk to me about that shit. But listen, Whitney, what, I, I, I will talk to my son about drugs, because I have Don't been me, Wendy, where the world the speculates day. where you Don't are, me, which is, uh, I was a full-blown cocaine addict, so well, I... I problem, not mine. Move on. Well, you know, that was my problem, Whitney. Uh-huh. Did you ask God to help you? And no, I ma- I managed. Thank God, because I have a good man. And, and, so, and I. so thank God I was able to just rise and up thank above God, it Wendy. and quit. And all I ask is, okay, okay. And you on Diane Sawyer also mentioned that um, 
you want to see receipts behind the drug use. I don't know, man. If I spent that much money, somebody better give me the receipts so I get a tax return. Well, speaking of spending money, so recently I was hearing that you were trying to trim the budget, which, by the way, Whitney, I thought that this was something... Where the hell are you getting your information from? Who's calling you and telling you? Um, uh, well, I got this story from a gossip named Steve Hers. You ever hear of him? No. Well, like you said, gossip. Yeah. Steve yeah. Hers is a West Coast correspondent, and um, we we uh, I communicate with all the different gossips. Uh, it's it's what we do. You know. Uh, you are going to have a gossip lunch, huh? Something like something like that. <laughs> Anyway, Whitney, yes. uh, they're saying that um, you're doing some massive budget cuts. I'm doing massive changes. And you know what? Yeah. I, I wanted to let you know that this is something I think is good. This is a good Whitney thing. You like it. You approve. Yeah, I really approve. Oh, Whitney, please. Listen, they were saying that you were uh, you cut your mother's um, See, you don't know what the f allowance. About. See, don't make me curse on the radio. I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, come on. Well, Steve was saying it was from about like $1,600 a week to about $500 a week. There's I asked you to kiss my Okay. He and also don't anybody else ever think I'd do that to my mother, you low down dirty He also was letting me know that Michael, Gary, and your sister Donna, who run your nippy company, are also uh, experiencing the slashes across the board. They were saying that you have a 24-hour-a-day bar on site at your studio that you're now cutting down and you're not making your personal chef available to people to just come up in your house and just order food and stuff. I think that's all good. That never happened. I don't even know what the heck you're talking about. Well, I have no idea what you're talking about, Wendy. How is Bobby Christina doing? Growing and being a beautiful young lady that God sent her here to be. Yeah, she's nine now, right? Yes, yeah, she is. Mm. When your husband was um, incarcerated for those few days, what types of things do you tell her concerning, like, do you say, like, daddy's away visiting Boston? Or? I don't really talk to her. We taught she was she's a stead patient. She's a child who has intelligence. Okay. My child is smart. No, what I'm I talk to shut your mouth. I talk to her like she's an intelligent human being, okay? And I give her just as much as she can handle for a nine year old because I'm her mother, okay? And that's how we deal with it. Never mind what I told her, but she know the deal. Well, a lot of the, a lot of parents, a lot of parents whose spouse or what have you goes through something, a lot of, particularly because that was only eight days, would have either taken them out of school for the eight days or taken them away from watching T V to you know. See I do what I do to protect my daughter, Wendy, just like you would do to protect your son, okay? All right. You are very defensive, Whitney. I have to be, Wendy. You talk about me every f***ing day. Well, Whitney... And every other day. Whitney, you, you keep yourself in the headlines. No, Wendy. Y'all keep me in the headlines. I mind my business. I try to maintain what I got. I want to know what I'm doing all the time. I don't give a shit about what you're doing all the time. As long as you're healthy and God is blessing you and you're doing the right thing and being a decent person, I can handle that. When's the last time you talked to Robin? About a week ago. Because I know that you and Robin were girlfriends from when you were growing up. And, and we're still friends, girl. Okay. Um, will she be working back with you, or is she still... Wendy, 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 Wendy. Yeah. Robin Robin not doing anything? No, Robin don't work for me. She'll work for me now. Moving right along. Uh -huh. Okay, so okay. so okay. Our, our king of R&B, is he working on an album? Bobby, is Bobby working on an album? Yes, ma'am. When do you think his album will be out? Uh, very soon, Wendy, I'm sure. A numerologist came on the show the other week, oh, hell. and we we ran you guys' yeah. numbers. And for what it's worth, the numerologist said that you and Bobby are so right for each other. Honey, he, he's so right. He's never been more right in his life. That's the most rightest thing you ever said. Yeah, thank you, Whitney. Uh huh. There was another portion of that, and, and don't worry about it, Will. But there, a, a different excerpt of that same conversation where Whitney had told Wendy that you know, Wendy, you from Asbury Park, New Jersey. I, Whitney Houston, and from Newark. <laughs> you keep fucking playing games. I'm going to show you I'm from Newark, said Whitney Houston infamously. Wow, that just goes to show you how long ago that particular clip was. Whitney, rest in power, was alive. Her daughter, oh my God, Bobby Chris was only nine and Bobby Chris is gone. Um, but a couple of things jumped out there, guys. For one, uh, Wendy Williams told Whitney Houston that she didn't think that the interview that Whitney had done with Diane Sawyer was portraying her in the best light. Is Whitney cackling from heaven right now after that graphic documentary of Wendy Williams clearly not being shown in the best light? In that interview, Whitney Houston <laughs> got from Wendy Williams. Wendy Williams said to Whitney, well, Whitney, I have a good man at home. Mm. Came to find out Wendy's ex-husband, Kevin Hunter, 
uh, maybe not a good man, <laughs> maybe not a good man spending her money on his side girlfriend. And they had a baby while Wendy and Kevin were still together. And let the, and let's bring this full circle to the, the Wendy Williams documentary. It's just very ironic to me. And I'm not going to lie. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't rejoice in people's misfortune at all. Uh, but I do appreciate karmic justice when you see it come round. And that Wendy Williams documentary was in some ways some karma for Wendy based off the way that she treated people like Whitney and, and, and people like Whitney who were similarly situated. And again, this is not to take up for celebrity. This is this is solely looking at this from inside of, of their world, well, from the outside looking inside their world. But Whitney Houston was doing exactly what she told Wendy she was doing. She said, I'm minding my business and trying to maintain my position. That's it. You don't have to speculate about my drug use. You don't have to speculate about my children. You don't have to speculate about how much money I'm giving my mama. And some would say that is the nature of the game. But the way that Wendy Williams played that game um, was particularly insensitive, I think, with intention. And again, we're talking in, in this case about Whitney Houston. Whether or not Wendy wanted to admit it at that time or not, it was someone who was clearly dealing with substance abuse. And Wendy even recognized that herself by admitting her cocaine problem. Um, but that didn't stop her from antagonizing publicly and repeatedly on a daily, if not weekly basis, a person that she knew in some form or another was having an issue with substance abuse, right? And Wendy allowed herself to pile on to Whitney as well as the rest of the paparazzi, white press, black press. And Wendy was part of that. And we lost Whitney eventually um, from substance abuse. So I'm not saying Whitney, Whit all, the, all these, all these itneys and these W, W, start with a W, N, what a Y is fucking me up. But I'm not saying Wendy bears any responsibility for Whitney Houston's demise. But what I am saying, the way that she handled and dealt with Whitney was an extreme poor taste um, and, and not something, and not in a conduct that I particularly view as being admirable, right? I, I seriously cram to understand. I don't understand why this lady has engendered such devotion from her fans. It's very strange. Okay, we'll pop up the clip uh, where Wendy shits on the help. I, I, I might have titled that. But I, I have a couple clips from this documentary in case you didn't see it. And some would say, okay, well, Whit, uh, Wendy is dealing with substance abuse. She's a, clearly a heavy, heavy alcoholic. And now has a a diagnosis of aphasia. And you remember um, if it was from the Daily Mail, you remember because there's one from the Daily Mail and it's like one from uh, the skies. TikTok. They both TikToks. It's like you got three, like two, three, two or three TikToks. That's about it. I didn't say it says something about the help. Hold on. Hold on. I'll check. So while this woman was receiving services, and again, you, you in, in the documentary, you see her being very abusive to the people who are assisting her. Um, and I don't know whether or not that necessarily can be attributed to her substance abuse issue or even her disability. Um, from what I understand, this lady was a nasty. I got it. Were you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. A very nasty person to begin with extremely entitled, uh, took that whole queen of media shit, literally like diva fucking behavior. And this clip, I think is deplorable. And, and this isn't even the worst of how she behaved in the documentary, but this in particular jumped out to me. This is Wendy receiving a manicure and listen to how she speaks to the nail tech. Let's take a look. Only one coat, please. You only want, okay. Yes, just one. Oh, oh God. What are you doing? Uh, let's just make sure that the, the coat no, is here. So no, no, take this off. Okay. You said the same thing. Take that off. Okay. Are you stupid? <laughs> She's disgusted with me. That's okay. Young Diller. Can I take this off? Yeah. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one of the things I think her fans are concerned about is her health. Are you concerned at all about her mental health? In regards to Wendy's health, like, I'm not going to say that I'm concerned as if I'm worried about her. So, a very small exchange, but I think a very telling exchange, you guys, because this is how you can tell the true character of people. Period. How do you treat those that are performing a service for you? How do you treat your Uber driver? How do you treat 
the waitress? How do you treat your nail tech? Like how, how do you treat people that are performing services? Um, at, at least with the bare minimum of respect. And to ask someone that you don't know who is doing a service for you, if they're stupid, are you stupid? Mind you, the nail tech entered the space, at least how it was edited by the documentary. The nail tech had entered the space and told Wendy what a fan she was of her. And Wendy repaid her by asking her, was she stupid? And this is the kind of behavior that I don't think is unusual for Wendy Williams. I think this has been somewhat well reported um, that she, again, maybe treats people around her pretty poorly. And perhaps her alcoholism and substance uh, abuse and even disability uh, helps to exasperate that. I want us to look next, if we could, at another clip here. Because you guys, this lady, this, this, watching this was a little triggering. Because I have intimate experience with alcoholism. There are alcoholics on both sides of my family. Um, one of my former partners was an alcoholic. And so out of all the substance abuse issues, right? Honestly, alcoholism is, is, is the one or alcohol dependency syndrome, whatever the fuck they're calling it now. Alcoholism is the one I have the least empathy for. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay. So for people who find themselves addicted to heroin or crack or methamphetamines, those addictions come after like one hit, two hits, right? Like you do crack once, you want crack. You do heroin once or twice, you on heroin, right? You do meth, you on the meth like pretty soon. Alcoholics are different. Alcoholics have to practice to become good alcoholics, right? You have to build a tolerance. That takes time. That takes a lot of intention. I'm going to try to get drunk so I can be better at getting drunk, okay? And I think out of all of the substance abuse addictions, alcoholism is definitely some of the most um, dangerous. Uh, people can, can hurt themselves very easily whilst drunk. We know that drunk driving still remains a very big problem uh, on the road, not just here, but around the world. People drive drunk and it's, and it's a, a, a huge issue. And alcoholics, um, it, alcoholism is, is some of the most life-destroying substances or substance abuse issues that you can have. And people sometimes are extremely proficient at being functioning drunks, right? Whitney, God damn, I keep saying Whitney. Wendy Williams, what I saw from her in that documentary, I said, this is a talented drunk. What do I mean by talented drunk? Where someone is so wasted that they're not even slurring, okay? Like they not wobbling, they not wavering. They can have a conversation with you and not slur a word. Now, if you know how they are sober, you might, if you know them well, you might could distinguish that this person is probably drunk. But if you didn't know them, right, if you didn't know in some of those sit down interviews during this documentary when Wendy is all made up. And she's sitting down with the producers. Now, she's not being coherent. She's not making a lot of sense. But you don't necessarily discern that she's intoxicated, right? Like, because she's not slurring. Eyes aren't red. Eyes aren't watering. She's not giving you those traditional uh, physical presentations of being intoxicated off alcohol. And that is from years of heavy, intensive drinking. Trust me, I know. I know. And some of the things in the documentary I thought were perhaps a little contrived where they were finding these empty bottles. But then again, as someone um, who was in a, a long-term relationship with someone who was dealing with alcoholism, I too would find empty bottles, random places all around. So my empathy for Wendy Williams as somebody that is dealing with a substance abuse issue and a mental health issue is there. I have sympathy for her as a human, uh, but because I have seen a lot of her career um, and seen the ways in, in, in which 
she used her position of influence not for the betterment of any people, let alone our people, right? And I think to me, that I and I know I'm naive in this and I'm shame on me, but I'm sorry. Like I do feel as though black people who are in positions of, uh, who are visible should use their platforms to bring awareness to issues that impact our community in particular, or use their in, their platforms in a way to help ameliorate the the conditions of our people, right? I never saw Wendy Williams do that, y'all. And if she's done that and I missed the shit, tell me, because I'm telling you, only thing I've ever seen her do is occasionally admit to some of her shortcomings. She had to own up to some of these health issues while the Wendy Williams show was still on the air because it was apparent that there was some sort of deficiency mentally there, cognitively. There was some sort of deficiency there. So she had to say something, but I'm not, I, I, I am not here for the rewriting of this Wendy Williams narrative. Okay. The karma that I see her experiencing is not because she, she's fallen down drunk or because now she has dementia. That's not the karma, her disability and her Substance abuse issue are not the karma. The exposure here is the karma. Whether or not she intended for this documentary to get out, whether or not she knew she was in the right frame of mind to know what she was about to be broadcasting to the world, I don't know. But that kind of exposure that that documentary revealed, the Whit the Wendy Williams who interviewed Whitney Houston would have never allowed herself to be exposed in that way. And I think she would have been absolutely horrified at, um, the, the, the level of, um, desperation that that documentary revealed. One of the clips that I got, I, I didn't get it, but one of the clips that jumped out to me is when the woman assistant goes in to try to wake Wendy up and she can't wake her up. And she's on the, the woman assistant gets on the phone with the male assistant, Will, and she's like, yo, she's like, I can't get her up. She's like, there's vomit everywhere. And I'm like, yo, that's, that, that is, that's down bad. That's down bad. Um, cue up for me, if you could, Will, the clip of uh, Kevin Jr. So let me tell you guys this story. I said this on Instagram and I know not everybody follows me on Instagram, which is fine. <laughs> so let me say it here. So when, when I was an intern at Power 99, in Philadelphia in the year 1999, Wendy Williams was anchoring the morning show there. She was live and local in the morning in Philadelphia. I had auditioned, though not with any seriousness because I was a goofball, but regardless, I had auditioned for the overnight slot at Power 99, which is 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And there were a couple of overnights that I would be getting off the air at 6 a.m. and I would be bumping into the morning show. And I bumped, I, I met and encountered Wendy Williams in person. And I said this on Instagram. Physically, she's kind of imposing because this bitch is big. <laughs> she's just a big, big lady. Uh, she's she's every bit of six feet tall. Um, she's just, she's she's large, right? And, and I mean, I say this from the perspective of, of a five foot two person, right? So it, six feet period is big to me. A six foot woman, whew, that's a big chick. And then she had these big basketball titties, right? So all, so, so her girth, her height, her, her augmentation, everything on her face, it was all in, in imposing and a little off putting to me because who needs all the basketball titties? <laughs> but it's, who needs all that? But she did. So, so, and, and to be clear, like I never really crossed words with her aside, like good morning. You know, I mean, who am I? I was an intern. I wasn't about to chat up no fucking Wendy Williams, but I didn't like her in the first place because she had already been popping shit about red and meth trying to, you know, paint them as, as gay, which at that time, 1999 year old me had a real problem. <laughs> Don't be trying to say red man gay out here because we was all, not all, and I mean, that's to speak for everybody, but I was deeply immersed in hip hop and rap culture and it was homophobic, right? And even though I disagreed with homophobia, uh, I, I guess my own homophobia was don't say the man I think is cute is gay because don't do that. <laughs> leave, leave, leave red man out of this shit. So I didn't like Wendy Williams. I didn't like her shtick. I didn't like anything 
about her. I respected her. I respected her ascension, but I did not like the way that she did it. And I think that this documentary kind of coming full circle to reveal um, her in some of her weakest moments, in some of those same moments that she took extreme delight in revealing about other black artists. Uh, she seemed to tra- take pleasure in repeating and, and reporting on people's misfortunes. And that's something that I, I, I just never understood. And I never caught quite got why people loved her so much for that. Uh, but I wanted to point this out really quick about substance abuse and in particular alcoholism, everybody, because the alcoholism is bad, bad, bad out here. And in fact, um, I would put up that cdc.gov real quick. Cause I do want to just make a, a little public service announcement real quick, because I find that a lot of folks are either don't know they don't show, or they don't care about what's going on in the bar. Okay. Now what's going on in the bar. There's a lot of things. Will you find that joint for me? Because alcoholism and the consumption, the overconsumption of alcohol, the way that alcohol is glamorized here in America, the way that we are all socialized into thinking that drinking is it. Even people at my big ginormous fucking age, I'm in my mid forties. The fact that niggas still want to get out here and get drunk and do bottles and shit. You niggas is old. (laughs) I need y'all to cut it the fuck out because you cannot keep up this pace. Okay. So the CDC says that excessive drinking for women constitutes four drinks in a single occasion. Okay. For men, the number is five drinks or more in a single occasion that constitute a night of heavy drinking. So women, if you've had four or more drinks in a single occasion, that's at night or wherever the fuck you was at your, at your sister's bachelorette party, whatever, four more drinks, that's excessive drinking for men, five or more drinks, that's excessive drinking. But when we looked at, at this for what it means for over the course of a week, how the CDC defines heavy or excessive drinking or people who on a consistent basis. So for women, the number is eight or more drinks per week. Okay. You hear me, girls? What qualifies as heavy drinking, heavy alcoholism, according to the CDC, for women, that's eight or more drinks a week. For men, that number is 15 or more drinks a week. And that sounds like a good amount. But think about your brunch. (laughs) Think about when you and your cousins go out to brunch. Think about when you and your co-workers getting off work. And y'all go on the happy hour. I mean, these drinks can add up. And I think a lot of people have varying levels of alcohol dependency and they don't even know it. For my former partner, who, by the way, might I add, quit drinking and has managed to remain free from alcohol for, I believe, close to a year. Okay. But it wasn't until I I framed these numbers to them and was like, so let's let's break this down. How often do you have five drinks or more? You have five drinks or more twice a week, three times a week, three, four or five. Yes, four or five. <laughs> Those drinks add up, you guys. And alcoholism has, it, th- th- there's no benefit to alcohol. There's no nutritional benefit to alcohol. Alcohol doesn't do nothing but literally fuck up your body. It fucks up your liver. It fucks up your kidneys. It fucks up your brain. And for Wendy's son, Kevin Jr., to take such a specific issue with her drinking, he is intimately familiar with what this alcoholism looks like in his life. Um, but I, I wanted to play cue up that clip of Kevin Jr., if you could, for me, Will. Because, you know, a, a, a part of Wendy Williams' karma, a, aside from this public spectacle of her in declining health and declining, you know, um, mental acuity. It's very clear that this lady has a lot of money, but she doesn't have a lot of friends. Okay. Karma. 
let's let's take a listen to what her son Kevin Jr. said in the documentary. When she's in New York, she doesn't have anybody to really call on to really want to do anything with her unless they're being paid. I think that once she realizes that, that's when the lonely feeling really sets in. That's when self sabotage occurs, and she drinks and smokes e e pens, and it just looks like you know we're heading down the same path of self sabotage. And gang, the child, this young man, I think he's in his early 20s. I think he's like 21 or something. He said at a different point in the documentary that he's afraid that his mom is going to die. And I think that's a very legitimate concern that he has given the amount that she drinks and the amount that she smokes. Um, I think I've shared you guys with you guys. Um, my father was an alcoholic, a, a proficient alcoholic, a very talented drunk, also a very heavy cigarette smoker. I'm guessing at least three packs a day. My dad used to smoke. My dad died at age 53 of lung cancer. But I'm sure, I'm sure that all that drinking and all that heavy smoking and heavy drinking is what helped to shorten his life tremendously. And I look at Wendy Williams and I said, oh, she not gonna last very long on this, on this trajectory. Because you can't drink heavy it looks like vodka was her choice of drink. She had bottles of Kettle One around the joint when she was filmed out at a restaurant. She was ordering Grey Goose vodka, y'all. Can y'all imagine doing vodka like that? She's doing vodka and she's smoking vape pens. Now, for some reason, people think that vaping tobacco is somehow safer than smoking actual cigarettes. Incorrect. <laughs> In fact, it's probably more intense. You're probably getting more nicotine and other chemicals uh, in the vape because it's just more concentrated. So I see this lady drinking heavy and smoking heavy. No, at this rate, she is not going to be here long. And again, I'm not wishing a short life on her. I'm just saying that as, as an observer and someone who looked at this documentary and b believed, I guess, 80 to 90% of it, right? Like, it, 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 uh, sure, it's a Lifetime TV special and I'm sure it was played up in certain ways to, to make it look perhaps worse than it was, but it looked pretty bad. <laughs> it absolutely looked pretty bad. Um, and I just wanted to say, you guys, it, it's, 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 it's a shame that some are saying that this woman is being exploited by these cameras. I disagree. I saw a person who was so desperate for attention, so desperate for fame, you know, they, they came back to that story numerous times about her being six years old in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and how she knew she wanted to be on a race. This lady wanted to be famous, and she still wants to be famous. She wanted to be on TV. I don't think Wendy Williams kind of cared at this point in her life how she came across <laughs> on TV. She just wanted her ass back on television. Um, and I still think that this whole thing is a setup for a comeback because there's nothing America loves better than a redemption story, than somebody coming back or triumphing over, you know, their adversity or over in, in, in most recent years, people are really cheering for people to overcome addiction. And I think that that's well and good. Uh, but I want people to be as honest. Okay. Like you can feel sorry for Wendy Williams and you can look at her and, and be like, down, you know, damn, you know, she, she down bad. But what I don't want to happen, I don't want the narrative to be rewritten about her. Like she earned her stripes and was set at the position that she was in part because of her talent, but in part because she never spoke up in any positive or meaningful or truly inspirational way for black people for black women, she always spoke up for herself, right? She spoke up for herself. But did she speak up for black women en masse? No. Did she speak up for black people en masse? No. Uh, she has, she's, she's deeply anti-black in some instances. She's even misogynistic. Yes, women can also hate women, right? She's misogynistic in her way. And all of her insecurities, despite the fact that she tried to project, um, judgment and, you know, like moralistic attitudes on celebrities lives. Look at your life, girl. Look at you. Look at your life. You got a good man. Oh, <laughs> you thought you did. Oh, oh, you, you wouldn't present yourself in a bad light. Oh, you thought, huh? Well, disability and substance abuse can be humbling as fuck. So keep in mind, always gang, you reap 
what you sow out here, what you put out in the world will come back and see you again. Okay. Count on that. Take that shit to the bank. So if to be successful, you have to tear others down. The day will come when you too will be laid bare, exposed, and torn down and revealed for who you actually are. So please don't let these Wendy stands be like, oh my God, Wendy was so inspirational. Inspirational where? Inspirational when? Inspirational how? Ask the questions, please. <laughs>